No questions? All right on. I've <laughs> baked everybody into a sweaty... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you think it's like horse and cart? It would be really fun to take a great example, really fun to have games to justify it. Yeah. Um, because obviously this is a time, it's a cost, it's a lot of risk involved. Uh, you know, give people tools to play going. Brilliant. But kind of, you know, when you're working on, on a title, yeah. it's hard to justify this. You have to have a really good reason. Yeah. Um, so, you know, having more titles out there that are leading ways would be really useful. What do you mean, like procedurally based games? It could be procedural based games. Yeah. I mean, conventional games just yeah. use procedural games. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, like say the SimCell game, for me it made sense to make that all synthesis, but I went sort of the opposite way on uh, Vessel. I recorded all the sounds myself and then I just used granulations that make the, the sound sort of bend to the visuals. Um, I mean, um, I think it, that is always the first question, is to figure out how to match the picture. Like, we don't just need to use a hammer because we like hammers. You know, it's good to think, like, do we actually need this tool or not? But I think that, I, I still find it weird that we're at this point and we have a lot of people, say, composing stuff in Logic or Ableton or whatever it is, and then we flatten it down to, like, digital audio tracks and then we pop it back out on the other end to, like, oh, now you can make these tracks, like, you know, crossfade with each other. Like, and why not have the actual score itself get exported into the game? And I mean, that's what uh, some in-house tools do, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of like that point, because I mean, I, I, there was a point where I was doing some maps for like a, a first-person shooter, and there was like this building you were in, and there was these little cracks, and I thought, oh, it'd be cool if I could have like these little procedural kind of like whistles like coming through the building. and. I'd say like I'd, I'd, I'd just got like a loop of noise that was just like filtering with uh, fiddlers like in the game and, and just working on that and you know, I was putting more and more time into it and then I just kind of thought what, what am I doing? I, mean, <laughs> I was going to be shooting around there's all these like explosions going off and all the rest of it so it, 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 it wasn't worth the time, it mm. wasn't worth it in the game, I think mean, the game context is yeah massively important. So, and, and, yeah. You know, that's all you're doing for trying. Um, you know, lane and all this lot, you know, and, and all the specs. Um, but it's not worth the time and effort to implement a bit of rain or a bit of wind when it doesn't even sound like rain or wind. Yeah. Um, you know, there needs to be just this compelling reason that solves a problem that you've got and to bring things. And then it's worth doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and what you were saying as well about tying in those parameters as well into like a single more rain, less rain thing. I, think, I guess those two points are kind of. Make some yeah, and it's it's deciding like when being a sound designer, you use uh, like a rain sound or especially a wind sound as a, an emotive thing. Like wind is really it's got you know, it's got a real voice to it, and so that is really at this point hard to get with the tools because it doesn't sound that realistic. And more so, I think what you can do is you can make. Uh, procedural audio that, like like I tried with the game, it's not meant to be realistic, but it's meant to be authentic. Like, it's meant to generate a response. And so, like, you want to have your audio world, like, internally consistent, so you're not breaking sort of that uh, imaginary world. But, yeah, like, you don't want to have... Yeah, you don't want to be just throwing stuff in there for the sake of it. And you don't want to be creating a world that's kind of dead. Because if you listen to the rain that's being procedurally generated, but it has no, uh, no feel like it has no reason, like it has no, it's kind of weird, but it has no like it has no intent, you know, like it's just being thrown in there. That that's a thing that you can hear as a listener. And like when working, I've worked in dance, and like that's a huge thing where you've got any sort of mixed media, including games, is where if you throw things in that don't support the larger vision, then it's really obvious as a viewer or as a player. You're just like, why did they do that? Like, it just, it doesn't work. So I think that that's the problem, is that a lot of times we get stuff that's technically working, like, oh yeah, it's just like, you know, now it's whistling right to this, and like, if you stand next to it, you know, 
and there's no guns going off, then like you can, <laughs> you know, determine which you know way the wind's coming, and then like you know, then I can make the sounds from that direction, like you know, like actually, like you can hear more from the way that the wind's pushing the sound towards you, and like yeah, you can get into a lot of detail, but. I think uh, the tricky part is really like marrying that stuff together and then uh, making it so that you can work with it fast enough so that you can throw that stuff away. Because like you say, if it's not a big time investment, like if you could do that in a matter of whatever, like if you just draft it, like, you know, do a, a digital sketch kind of thing really quickly, then you can throw it away. But whereas now, it, the technology, it takes you so long to get to that point. And that's part of the reason why, like, yes, I do know how to program, but I don't really want to spend all my time, you know, doing a C++, this, that, or the other thing. I would much rather do it in pure data because it's just immediate to me. I can do a sketch, and then it's quick. And then if I don't like it, I throw it out, you know. And also, it's like, you know, the, yeah, using the right tool for the right purposes. And I don't besides that patch, I don't compose a lot of pure data because I just find that it's like, it really just feels like I'm like this, like, you know, and I've got this huge thing that I need to deal with. And like, when you're so close to it, a person will listen, like, and I was really guilty of this. I don't know, I, I struggle with it where I put in too much detail and then people have a first read or a first listen and they're like, that's a mess. Like it just, because I've been sp spending so much time with it that I hear all the little bits and pieces, but then when you throw it at someone and you know you don't actually do that first read kind of thing, then it sounds like a mess. And uh, it's I think it's really easy to do that technically because you have basically like the economic sunk cost. You spent so much time doing it that you don't want to let it go. You know, and it's the same thing for people that are you know they're composers and then they mix the game. Music's probably going to be loud. Right, but it doesn't necessarily support the game in the best way possible, right? Yeah, yeah. And going back to Paul's point, um, mm -hmm. games are already designed around sample sound, right? I mean, it, so there's always this argument of why we use procedural audio and samples do exactly what they need to do. So, I w we've had companies come to us, most of us, and say, "Oh, we'd really like to implement it, but we don't want to take the risk. We don't have the money. We don't have the budget." And they say, what's the ultimate demo? And what is the ultimate demo? Like, how would you... GTA 5. <laughs> I don't know if it is, though. Like, what, yeah, what about a yeah. game which really it's plays game. with audio? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I kind yeah. of... I sort of think that GTA is... The, the great thing about that video, when that happened, I think, is that... Well, the interesting thing was that a lot of people went, oh, it's 35% procedural. Yeah. But that's, in a way, is kind of good and bad because it's sort of like oh well that just sounds like samples exactly yes. um, that's but, true you know yeah. i think you know the ultimate demo in that sense is is something that you you can't do in any other way apart from at runtime yeah that's true it's so, gta isn't it it's like, yeah it's so, just it could be yeah. gta 4 as soon as i say like, to a developer yeah. oh gta have it they'll just glaze over yeah. it's a completely different scale to everything else i keep doing that yeah, but I mean, it's also like if something could happen yeah. because it happens at runtime, mm -hmm. then there's no other, you know, it's actually being generated out of something completely unique that's happening in gameplay at that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, that's impossible to do <laughs> beforehand. You know? it, it is. So, yeah. so I think those are the kind of things, but it's not, um, it isn't really a, a, a necessarily a, a game audio question or an audio question. It's more of a what's the conceptual idea that's going on in this game or this experience. Yeah. You know, which is it might be different to the way that you know it's been approached in the past. Yeah, and I think that that's a design, like an audio thing as well, like it's supporting the design, but then. If you have people asking you how the audio can inform the overall design, yeah. that often is a difficult. It's hard to get there. Like that's well, it's a, almost like what it's the other way around. It's like, well, what, what could we do now? Yeah. You know, like what, what could happen if um, the player was generating melodic seeds, which. Yeah evolve into something else as they're doing it, you know. So it, it's sort of impacting a compositional level or they're, yeah. they're working with, you know, 
Yeah. Like that was the whole thing, really. Our uh, JD, I guess, was that, that we were working with sounds that were happening in the world around people. Yeah. So that's that's not possible in any other way apart from your runtime. Yeah, so how did you deal, say, with that question, like, before you, say, had the RJDJ patch, would you show, like, similar patches and sh sort of show the experience, or...? Well, I think, the, the, I guess the difference is that we were never trying to, we were never trying to create something that had been done in, a, in another way before, so yeah. we, were, we were looking at a possibility space, really. And thinking, what could you do here if you were running an audio engine yeah. on a phone and yeah. someone was in the street? Yeah. So that's we weren't really trying to sort of um, make a comparative, like a replacement of another system, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I think that's kind of what GTA Five is. It's yeah. like replaced a way of doing things with another method. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, but I was going to ask you actually, what do you think is, because I think about this quite a lot at the moment, is what's the kind of biggest area which is not functioning properly in this big chain of stuff <coughs> to make this happen? Um, because, you know, if you've got like um, the tools to do it, whatever that would be, PD heavy sort of deployment, then you know all of the great stuff they did at Rockstar in terms of profiling and understanding risk and sort of understanding the load of all the, the different work that people are doing. Um, but kind of before all of that is this area where you're really working. You know you're really working with people who are learning how to make those decisions creatively. Yeah. And you know I think you're in quite an interesting position because you can see a wide range of people who are kind of learning that, starting to think in the way that you need to, to do this sort of thing. Mm. Um, and do you think that like that is a, a bigger problem, the amount of people who can think like that? Or do you think that the, the tool chain is a, is a bigger problem? Um, I think it's the, I think it's sort of if I was to do one, sort of the cart horse kind of thing, I, I think I would go for tools first. Uh, because if you're trying to train people on, an, on a, you know, try to, like, because that's kind of what we've all been doing is that I think we've been struggling against, in a sense, like with what the tools, the easy tools are capable of. And it's been, it's a fun kind of exercise, but also it means that uh, it just falls flat for a lot of people. You know, the more barriers that you have to entry, the more people fall off. I mean, just to say, we're all guys here, and there's a certain, you know, and there's a certain, you know, yeah. it, it, there, and it's not, I mean, that's a whole other issue, but I'm saying that, you know, like, there's a certain crowd that this kind of thing currently attracts. So, you know, uh, from teaching, I think that uh, there will, there's, like, the people that are coming in, that if we just sort of open up the the way of that people can get through those steps, then we'll simply have more people coming here and doing more diverse, you know, like things within this space. And that's part of the reason. That's one of the main reasons that I do the school is that I try to make it fairly accessible. And I, you know, I only teach in English, but I, I do have people from all around the world taking you know courses. And I think. For me, that's super exciting because I want to have, I want to see and hear games that are done by people from different cultures, not just, you know, sort of Japan, you know, Europe, North America, right? So I have a lot of people that are, you know, from Brazil, say, like emerging markets, you know, and just people that are, now they have the, they basically have a possibility of having people of their own culture purchasing those systems and purchasing those games and so they make games that reflect their culture um, but to come back like to what you're saying uh, I think that the tools will definitely help and uh, the reason why I say that is that like I feel like Wise and FMOD Studio have been huge for increasing the accessibility of just doing sort of the 95% of what you need to get done in game audio and so that's been amazing because I you know there's people that uh, you know, whatever that I've 
have the students in there and just like, oh yeah, I do music or whatever. And then, and then they get into it. They totally get into Wise or F Mod Studio, and they're just like, this is awesome. Whereas if I was just doing, like, or you know, if I threw more things in the path of like, you know, if I tried to get them to do a whole game in PD, which I did at the beginning. It's just you have more, you have higher attrition. You have more people that are simply not interested in doing that, and that's just the way that it is. So I think that the, having the tools uh, will definitely help, and sort of yeah, making it so that the tools are accessible, and to have it. Um, I think also the thing that was really uh, interesting when I was researching this is I was just thinking like, because I I love using Reactor for certain things. And then I was really curious why, like, Reactor hasn't been updated for ages. And then they just seem to throw the user library, like, it just, is it, like, it's like they don't care. But I think... I think the code of Reactor is a complete mess. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but if there was a lot, like, it's the same thing as, a, you know, I don't know if, anyways, that if, if the money was there, then they would put the effort in. Like if there was the return on their investment, then they would they would put in the time and then they would refactor it and they'd clean it up, you know, like they would just rebuild it. But I feel like there's there's simply the market, like because we're from the inside of the fishbowl, like looking out, that sometimes I feel like we're a little kind of like, ah, oh, Reactor's awesome, it can do all these things. And like, yeah, why doesn't everybody use it? Well, not everybody uses it and then... You know, in comparison to like, I don't know, however much money, say they make off of, well, I don't know, like a new version of Tractor or whatever their DJ system is, right? So it's that kind of thing, too, that I've found interesting that, uh, you know, on the, on the, just the mere fact that you have uh, Wise and FMOD Studio still surviving in a sense, like, you know, how much money can they be generating or is there even room for more people to come in, you know? So I think that's the other thing too, is that it's difficult um, to know from a just a functional like corporate standpoint of knowing what's uh, viable, and so that's the thing from working you know say like at larger companies like EA uh, is that I used to really not like the whole marketing side of things because I just thought oh they just they're you know, whatever, like put Limp Biscuit in there and everybody will love it. Like it had that kind of like, oh, they don't know. But then sometimes the thing, I guess, like being kind of an academic or kind of like a person that likes the, you know, whatever finer things or the little fiddly nerdy things is that like, you know, it's kind of like the hipster thing. I'm just like, oh, I was there when, you know, that kind of thing where like I naturally get drawn towards those things. And, um, I think it's easy to drop those when it seems like it becomes too popular. Like if people are really interested in like game audio, then the stuff that Wise does now with adapted music, like people, that kind of pushes a lot of people out of that space. Like that we're doing, you know, making their own custom patches, say, like, you know, because now you just do it in Wise, you know, and it, but it makes it so much more accessible. So um, the thing that, say just from the SimCell, uh, you know, like that's a small team. They had fairly big funding. So they had like a, uh, Amplify was their publisher. So they were basically going to push that system out to the whole LA school district. So there's like a lot of money involved with that. And then here's me sort of trying to sneak in, <laughs> like, you know, procedural audio stuff. And um, so it, I don't know if it necessarily, it, it, I feel like on the top side of it, so on one side, the tools I think should come first, but then on the other side, I also think that this idea of risk, once that's why I like the GTA thing, because like they, their company, as far as I know, grand, you know, like sort of rock star, like they're audio folk, like right up at the top. Whereas other companies are not like that. So you don't have like your sort of patron, like your person that's going to see the thing actually get through because like if you don't have that then it just falls apart like say like it happened with SimCell where I got to a certain spot and, like I can program but I can't I can't like I don't have enough time to to try to do all the compiler optimizations and make all the music and do the sound design and you know whatever like all, like there's just not enough time so uh, if you have uh, basically buy in from the top then like they did with the graphics they got another person to do the optimization for the graphics but they didn't do that for the audio because there wasn't enough win on their return 
where they can say like, oh yeah, that's actually gonna like make it 25% more likely that we'll have like stickiness, like that the, you know, the high school kid is not gonna put the tablet down or switch to the next app, right? So I think that that, that functional thing of where it does come down to money is something that I've run into a lot. And I think it's, uh, it's a big, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's, it can be debilitating because I, you know, I got really close where I felt like, yeah, and then you just hit that wall. And it sucks because I would much rather be able to say like, oh yeah, like I was able to change the BPM of the music interactively with the speed of the ship. And I thought that that would be awesome. Like I had all those things planned in the design, but I couldn't do them because we're flattened down to samples. It just wasn't possible anymore. Or like I could actually change like, you know, the cutoff frequency or like the distortion of the feedback level of the filter, depending on if you're about to go into a combat sec section of the game, right? Or just like basically thinking of like, how can I change things so that they uh, produce an emotional response based on multiple parameters? That's that sort of what I wanted to do with the system. So maybe what I'll do is that'll be a little segue into the, um, the demo section.